It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice right here, right now. Thank you for joining with us this morning. It's January 9th. And uh, I don't know about where you are, but it's awful bitter cold out here. I woke up to about an eighth of an inch of ice on my windshield and spent a good part of 20 minutes this morning chipping that off so I could actually get here. Hey, vey, I tell you what. Um, boy, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. You know, it seems like every day the level of Tyranny grows in our nation. And it's difficult for me to, um, you know, I, I do so much research and so much homework and so much study. And, and you know, it's, there's so much information out there. I can't possibly express it all. I mean, I would literally need to do a show not two hours a day, not three hours a day, five, six hours a day, just to sit and hit on all these news bulletins that are out there. And provide some level of insight into what they all mean. And not that, not that I'm some oracle that's got some you know, inner uh, uh, grandiose idea of what all of it means, but more along the sense that I, I view it as my job to try to give you guys an alternative viewpoint. You know, we get into the mode of, of listening and... and uh, as we are doing so, or, or reading and educating ourselves. But as we do so, oftentimes we find that we are not necessarily, we, we get drawn in. And when you get drawn in like that, what happens is you begin to believe what you read. Because, you know, for some reason or another, human beings, when they see things in writing, oftentimes kind of just accept it as factual or truthful. And it's not. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I look at it like my function here is to not necessarily tell you what to think, not to censor what the information is that you get. I can't, I mean, there's so much of it, folks, it's like, a, it's like trying to drink out of a fire, a, a fire hose. All I can do is provide you with enough information so that it gives you the, the kernel, if you will, to go out there and begin to, to do your own due diligence and your own homework. I don't expect that AVN and the show that I do and the stories that I talk about should be the beginning and the end all of your information feed, if you will. It's only an appetizer. It's enough to wet your taste buds. It's enough to wet your appetite to go out there and educate yourself so that you are thoroughly and fully cognizant of all the different aspects of what's happening in our country. You've got to do that. Because if you don't do that, then you're making the mistake of believing that the things I say should be your opinion. Or the things that you hear from others that you follow should be your opinion. And that is absolutely a critical mistake. Your job is to be an independent critical thinker who formulates and creates your own opinion. And to that end... I try to give you the, the kind of a helping hand, you know. It's kind of like you, when, you were, when you were teaching your, your son or your daughter to ride a bicycle, you know, you kind of stabilize the bike as they, as they get the, the momentum going because you know that once they get underway and the momentum is underway, that the balance will come. But, you know, it's hard to balance sitting at a standstill, right? You, you almost need that, that forward movement in order, and I'm not quite sure what that is. <laughs> Guys who have worked on unicycles have figured it out, but the rest of us haven't. And so we need somebody to kind of help, you know, stabilize the back of the seat while we get enough momentum going to be on our own. 
Okay, that's enough pontification for the morning. <laughs> um, I want to I want to I want to hit on four different topics this morning, which is the normal, you know, mantra here. One, and our first story is tyranny doesn't play by the rules. And the reason I say that is because, and we're going to talk about a couple of stories. By the way, all these stories are up on our Facebook website. Uh, uh, Patriot FB pages. They are all linked in the bottom of the YouTube video you're, you're watching right now, if you're, in fact, watching a YouTube video. Tyranny doesn't play by the rules because the two stories that are out are both the IRS and the NSA in these court cases are trying to change the rules by which the court can hear and see their tyranny and treason. So we're going to talk about what that is. And you know, here, here's the problem. It's one thing when it's two disparate individuals who are in a civil case, you know, and they're fighting about amongst each other and saying to the court, we ask you to be the Solomon, the wisdom to separate uh, the fact from the fiction and to separate the wheat from the chaff and determine and decipher and discern who's actually right here. It's another thing when you or or any ent- entity is going up against not the 800-pound gorilla in the room, not the, not the King Kong gorilla in the room, the 8-million-pound gorilla of the federal government. And they change the rules to suit themselves. And the court acquiesces and gives them an unfair playing advantage, as if they didn't already have one. Our second topic is define the definition, please, how language changes everything. And we're going to talk about a couple of examples of that because as, as part of a critical thinking skill, one of the things that you, you really need to recognize is when language is being manipulated by the changing of definitions to change your thought process and to manipulate you. That's the goal. Manipulation of your thinking process. Okay, our third topic. One half trillion dollars last year. The American population spent a half a trillion dollars to be in compliance with tyranny. Now, for the record, let's understand something. Our entire GDP is only $16 trillion a year. In other words, all the efforts of all the people, all collectively put together, only generate $16 trillion dollars. And we spent a half a trillion of that just complying with the tyrannical precepts of a government that wants to enslave and mandate and oppress and abuse all of us? You've got to be kidding. No wonder our economy is in the tanker. No wonder we've got 25 million people stumbling around like zombies out of a movie because they can't find a job. No wonder we've got we went from 12 million people on food stamps to 50 million in five years. No wonder industries are running away from the United States to go to foreign nations. The cost of compliance is just insane. And all of it, folks, is meaningless. It's all meaningless. It's not meant to solve a real problem. It's a red herring, a false flag. The goal of this compliance is not to correct some issue that's a real threat to the society as a whole or industry or anything else. The real purpose of all of this regulation serves one purpose and only one. That is to put businesses and and individuals, especially small businesses, in the mindset to acceptance that you are no longer in control. That's literally what it comes down to. And then our fourth topic, and then I'm going to get into our first topic. And this is going to be, you know, not linked to stories so much, although there's a couple, but if morality is dead in the United States of America, then with all due respect, folks, there is no more republic to be saved. Now, I know some people will get squeamish about that. But if morality is dead, you can forget the republic anyway. And that's the truth. 
Why do I say that? Well, because John Adams, and we'll discuss why, but, and, and, he's a guy, and he's a guy that I have some difficulty with in some ways, and I'll express, I'll express to you why. But he said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. And the reason why is because it requires self-governance, self-control, and it requires individuals who seek good as their primary focus, not evil, not power, not usurpation, not money or the power to abuse others in your chase to obtain money. Okay. Let's, let's get into our first topic, because otherwise we'll, get, we'll be here an hour from now and we won't be there. <laughs> uh, tyranny doesn't play by the rules. Well, that should be apparent to everybody, because that's how they got to be tyrannical in the first place. But when we talk about courts and we talk about government's role, there's two, there's two issues out here. First, there's an, a, a story out there by Josh Gernstein from Politico. And the topic and the headline of this is Fed's move to block discovery in the NSA lawsuits. The Justice Department has moved to block the plaintiffs uh, in the most successful legal challenges to the NSA's surveillance and spying and all of that from obtaining more details on how the surveillance effort operates. And basically, so if you don't know, because I'm pretty good at legal issues, the way that discovery and the premise behind discovery is this. All the information and all the evidence that can be brought to light in a case is meant to be exposed before the case actually gets to the court. So the, the, the defendant and the plaintiff both know what the other is going to bring up as evidence because that gives you an opportunity to have an apples-to-apples apples comparison and it gives you an opportunity to build a defense against their arguments and them to build a defense against yours. And the only way that a judge or a jury can actually rule on a case would be if you guys have an opportunity to both present the evidence and everybody knows what the evidence is and then we decide you know in in a solomonist solomonite manner how to how to split the baby (laughs) all right so here's the problem though both parties are supposed to have equal access to the information but when one side refuses to allow discovery, and in this case, it's the bully of the government, right, which has already got, you know, a significant level of, of benefit on their side just by virtue of their size and everything is a secret and so forth and so on, then how can the evidence be brought to light? How can the proof that, that's being secreted away, held down, if that's, be, if that's allowed to be kept secret, then how can any judge make a fair and equitable ruling in favor of anything if he's only getting half the information. Let me, let me give you an example on this, and I posted this up on Facebook, and it's kind of a reverse example. So when I say it's a flip-flop equivalent on Facebook and Patriot, I want you to understand what I mean by that. This is uh, it's an analogy, but what it does is it gives you the reverse side so that you see it from an, another perspective. This is the equivalent of a prosecutor who is in a courtroom and you're on trial for murder. And that prosecutor has evidence that, for all intents and purposes, proves your innocence. But he withholds it from the court and he withholds it from you. And you don't even know it exists. Okay, so the analogy is this. Prosecutor has a witness who's come forward and said... I saw the guy who committed the murder, and it wasn't the guy you're trying. I saw his face, and I know who it is. And I've got proof. I found the knife on the ground. It's got his fingerprints on it. And the prosecutor says, I'm not going to bring that information out, because if I do, this guy's going to get off. And so they withhold that information from the judge, And during the discovery process, the prosecutor never comes out and says to the defense, hey, uh, there's evidence here that your guy didn't commit the crime. You say, boy, that's an extreme example. That never happens. The heck it doesn't. I helped Jason Henry file a case in the Supreme Court. He's an attorney. He's one of our sponsors, by the way. 
417-256-4100. He filed a Supreme Court case on behalf of a 15-year-old kid who is serving a life sentence because the prosecutor and the judge worked in coercion and uh, worked in, in uh, cahoots, excuse me, to withhold the evidence that they knew that someone else had committed the crime. The, 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 the mother of the boy, who, he was 15 at the time, the mother of the boy had a boyfriend, and he's who actually committed the rape and murder. And the prosecutor knew it because someone else witnessed and testified and said, look, I've got the proof. Not only did the guy who really committed the murder admit it to me in prison, but here's the evidence to prove I'm right. And he actually gave the prosecutor evidence where he could go find bloody clothes, verifying that, in fact, the, test, the, the confession he had heard must have legitimately been true because the guy was sitting in a jail cell, right? How else would he know where to find bloody clothes unless the real killer had given him that information? But the judge and the, and the, and the, and the prosecutor withheld that information, not only from the, the defense, but from the jury. The kid was convicted, got a life sentence without hope of parole. Jason filed this case on his behalf because recently the law changed that said uh, it's an Eighth Amendment violation against cruel and unusual punishment. If you sentence a child under the age of 18 to life without hope of parole, they should at least have a hope of parole. Kid's been in jail for 27 years. He's still in. Courts have had, the state Supreme Court in Missouri has had this case, which was mandatory to be filed, has had this case now for almost a year and has not ruled on it. And the evidence is there. By the way, the judge is now dead and the prosecutor is now a judge. Got to love that one, huh? So don't tell me it doesn't happen. Here's my point. The feds have moved to block the discovery in the NSA lawsuits by saying, you can't have this evidence because if we give you this evidence, it will expose our secrets. Well, with all due respect, you know, the murderer wants to keep his secret too. The guy who robbed the bank wants to keep his secret too. That doesn't mean we let them. <clears throat> The murderer's excuse would be, I want to keep my secret because I don't want my family harmed. And I don't want to go to jail, which means I won't be able to provide, in, you know, provide uh, for them as, uh, while I'm in prison for the rest of my life. My wife will have to go fend for herself. My children will be without a father. Those are all legitimate reasons why a person would want to keep a secret, right? But they should have thought of that before they committed the murder. And the NSA should have thought, we're violating the Fourth Amendment and the rights of every single American before they committed their crimes. And crimes they are, make no mistake about it. They're crimes because they are a crime against the people of the United States of America, against our society, against our principles, against the rule of law, and against every individual that's been subjected to it, and a crime against our Constitution, which can be, tran can, can be um, I, I can't think of the right word, but you, you, know, you can commit a crime against the, con the Constitution because <clears throat> you're committing a crime against the principle of what it stands for. Now, the Constitution can't be a victim but you can, we can, the nation is the victim when the crime is perpetrated against the Constitution. The second case where this is going on is <clears throat> where the, uh, the um, Obama administration appoints The, I shouldn't say the Obama administration, although it is, the Department of Justice, Eric the Traitor Holder, has appointed a guy to head up the IRS Tea Party targeting investigation, right? The enemies list investigation that is sponsored by the IRS. 
Here's the problem. The guy is a frequent and significant donor to the Democratic National Committee and to President Obama's administration. You can't have a conflict of interest like that and load the dice, so to speak, for an investigation that, quite frankly, should have already been concluded. This has been going on for over a year now. For the record, out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I believe the number at this point is somewhere around 300, 350, of the companies or or groups that have applied for these 501c4 and were uh, targeted by the IRS as a weapon of mass destruction by the president, the usurper-in-chief, not a single one of them has been interviewed yet. Did you hear what I just said? How do you conduct an investigation when you don't interview the victim? I mean, you wouldn't say that in a murder case, would you? You wouldn't say, or, 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 or a, a, an assault case, you wouldn't say, I'm not going to interview the victim to see if she can identify the guy who punched her out and held her at knife point, would you? Of course you would. You'd say, hey, wait a second, what did he look like? What color was his hair? W- w- was he white or was he black or was he orange or was he yellow? Was he, was he tall or short? Was he fat or thin? What kind of clothes was he wearing? Did he have a knife? Did he have any rings or tattoos that you could see? Those would be the questions that someone who was truly interested in justice would ask. But we don't have that here. Okay, we're going to run out of time. When we come back, we're going to hit this define the definition, please. And I want you to really pay attention during this segment because... It's indicative of where things are going. I'd like you to make sure that you get a chance to uh, visit with our sponsors. Please make sure that you uh, work with the Battery Station. You can reach them uh, online at BatteryStation.com. They can be reached by telephone at 417-257-7799. They carry everything from batteries and flashlights to every kind of tactical gear, clothing, freeze-dried food, pretty much anything along the survival arena. Make sure that you contact them uh, and or get to their website. Their website does not show all their product lines, so make sure that if you go to BatteryStation.com and it doesn't show what you're looking for, uh, give them a call, 417-257-7799. Our friends over at Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard, they have a uh, lunch special from, uh, I think it's 11 to 2, and um, they have a, a salad bar there and, and, and a pasta bar. Please make sure that you... Uh, that you patronize our sponsors and tell them when you do that you heard about them from America's Voice Now. Contact Jason Henry, whether it's state or federal criminal law. You can reach him at 417-256-4100. He's on the square in West Plains, as is Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop. Uh, They can be reached at 417-257-1776. And while you're there, get yourself a good shave and a haircut. You can go over to Wits End Classic Barbershop, and you can do that right there. Witsend Classic Barbershop on the square in West Plains. We'll be back in just a few moments. When we come back, we're going to talk about define the definition. Why is it that tyrants always change the words so that when they change the language, we can't actually pin it all down? We're going to figure it right out now. Find us at americasvoicenow.org. Please email me directly. I'd like your comments and your feedback. You can send me email at mike at americasvoicenow.org. That's Mike at americasvoicenow.org. We'll be right back. Thanks for riding with us today. If you are um, visiting with us on our website live and you're uh, catching the show streaming, thank you. Appreciate you. Um, You can always catch our uh, audio clip there as well. And, um, and of course, we're broadcasting on PatriotFB.com. If you're not a member of PatriotFB.com yet, you should be. It's kind of a Patriot Facebook. Uh, It's loading up. It's it's just a brand new organization out there, which is uh, helping to uh, bring Patriots together. And at the same point in time, uh, expose you guys to new information that you can't find because Facebook censors things. The other Facebook, you know, the one that is run by that little punk who um, seems to have uh, 
more money than he knows what to do with. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about redefining language. Because we see it over and over and over again in the names of bills that Congress you know, brings forth. We see it in the many things that are um, labeled by government. And, and one of the prime ex examples of this is, um, well, there's two things, actually. But one of the ones is, a, is an article this morning I saw on CNS News. Now, th th this one's so blatant that you can't miss it. But I, I'm bringing it forth so that the analogy is so obvious that Helen Keller and Stevie Wonder can both see it and then have a discussion about it. Sheila Jackson Lee. Now, <laughs> if you've ever watched Sheila Jackson Lee in action, this woman is an embarrassment to the human race. She's out of Texas. She's a Democrat. I don't know how she's been on the, on the, in the House as long as she has. If, if you want to see a shameful and reprehensible excuse for a human being, Sheila Jackson Lee fits that bill pretty good. She is a racist. She's black. So she's a... And it's not reverse racism, folks. It's just racism. There's no such thing as reverse racism. There's racism, period. And if you are one color and you hate somebody else of another color, that's racism. And it doesn't really matter which color you start with and which color you hate. <laughs> right? That's another example, by the way, of redefining language. Oh, it's reverse racism. Um, that's putting the premise that everybody is... Everybody in the, in the first place is racist, so it's reverse racism if it's black against white. No, there is only racism, period. Let's not redefine things. But Sheila Jackson Lee has an interesting concept here. She wants to turn the word welfare to transitional living fund. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? She wants to change welfare to well, I'm not on welfare. I'm on the transitional living fund. <laughs> Why? Well, for the same reason that, you know, we, we, we don't want to, well, I shouldn't say we. The president doesn't want to use the word terrorism. For the same reason that all of these government programs, Social Security, Right? It's, it's a way to get you to accept something that is so abhorrent to you. But if you just change the name and it softens the, the stigma that's associated with the old name, then you're accepting of it. She's hailed the war on poverty as a success, which... Anyone with any intellectual honesty would have to disagree with. I mean, we've spent a trillion dollars in just the last you know, decade alone on this crap. And we have more poor people now than we've ever had before. And we have more people sliding into poverty than we've ever had before. You know, there was a, there's an article I posted up, up uh, I think it was last night, late. Uh, which was the final uh, article that was posted up by uh, Charlie Reese. And he's, an, he's a columnist for the Orlando Sentinel. And I'll read it to you briefly because it, it's, it fits in here. <clears throat> um, he's retiring, and this was his last column, and I think he basically wanted to throw out the finale of fireworks because <laughs> they couldn't do anything to him after this, right? 545 versus 300 million people. That's the, top, that's the title of his article. Politicians are the only people in the world who create problems and then campaign against them. Have you ever wondered if both the Democrats and the Republicans are against deficits? Then why do we have deficits? Have you ever wondered if all the politicians are against inflation and high taxes? Then why do we have inflation and high taxes? You and I don't propose a federal budget. The president does. You and I don't have the constitutional authority to vote on appropriations. The House of Representatives does. You and I don't write the tax code. Congress does. You and I don't set fiscal policy. Congress does. You and I don't control monetary policy. The Federal Reserve Bank does. 
100 senators, 435 congressmen, one president, and nine Supreme Court justices equates to a total of 545 human beings out of 300 million who are directly, legally, morally, and individually responsible for the domestic problems that plague this country. <clears throat> I excluded the members of the Federal Reserve Board because that problem was created by Congress. In 1913, Congress delegated its constitutional duty to provide a sound currency to a federally chartered but private central bank. I excluded all the special interests and lobbyists for a sound reason. They have no legal authority. They have no ability to coerce a senator, a congressman, or a president to do one cotton-picking thing. I don't care if they offer a politician $1 million in cash. The politician has the power to accept or reject it. No matter what the lobbyist promises, it is the legislator's responsibility to determine how he votes. Those 545 human beings spend much of their energy convincing you what they did is not their fault. They cooperate in this common con, regardless of party. What separates a politician from a normal human being is an excessive amount of gall. No, hu no normal human being would have the gall of a speaker who stood up and criticized the president for creating deficits. The president can only propose a, a budget. He cannot force the Congress to accept it. The Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, gives sole responsibility to the House of Representatives for originating and approving appropriations and taxes. Who is the Speaker of the House? John Boehner. He is the leader of the majority party. He and fellow House members, not the President, can approve any budget they want. If the President vetoes it, they can pass it over, they can pass it over his veto if they agree to. It seems inconceivable to me that a nation of 300 million people cannot replace 545 people who stand convicted by present facts of incompetence and irresponsibility. I can't think of a single domestic problem that is not traceable directly to those 545 people. When you fully grasp the plain truth that 545 people exercise the power of the federal government, then it must follow that what exists is what they want to exist. If the tax code is unfair, it's because they want it to be unfair. If the budget is in the red, it's because they want it in the red. If the Army and the Marines are in Afghanistan and Iraq, it's because they want them in Afghanistan and Iraq. If they do not receive Social Security, but are on an elite retirement plan not available to the people, it's because they want it that way. There is no, or, or I'm sorry, there are no insoluble government problems. Do not let 545 people shift the blame to bureaucrats whom they hire and whose jobs they can abolish, to lobbyists whose gifts and advice they can reject, to regulators to whom they give the power to regulate and from whom they can take away this power. Above all, do not let them con you into the belief that there exists disembodied mystical forces like the economy inflation, or politics that prevent them from doing what they take an oath to do. Those 545 people, and they alone, are responsible. They and they alone should be held accountable by the people who are their bosses, provided the voters have the gumption to manage their own employees. We should vote all of them out of office, and clean up their mess. So here's the point. <clears throat> when you've got people that redefine the, the way in which our language works, I'm going to give you some examples that are real world. Under the National Defense Authorization Act, They use the term indefinite detention. Now, first and foremost, I mean, most of us understand what indefinite means, right? And most of us understand what detention means. And they specifically mention and name Al-Qaeda 
in the section. But then they couch it with a bunch of false, manipulated language. And what it says is that in the event that you, including Americans, by the way, domestically right here, because the first thing they do is they state that there's no place on the earth that is not a part of the new, quote, battlefield in the war on terror. It's an undeclared war. It's a war that exists only as a phantom menace, if you will. And they state that you can be imprisoned indefinitely or detained, not imprisoned. Up, oh, so There's another definition slight, right? You can be detained. Well, you know, when you're sitting in a jail cell, that's imprisonment. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, but it is what it is. Having been there, by the way, I can express that that is the truth. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, but, you know, when the door shuts, you're in prison. Um, they can hold you indefinitely for a, and here it comes, belligerent act. Now, how do you define and how do you quantify what exactly is a belligerent act? I mean... A belligerent act can take a lot of forms, right? There's a lot of ways that you could commit a quote-unquote belligerent act. And it all depends largely on how that word is defined. And here's the rub. Those words can only be defined when you get in front of a judge who can define them. Who can, uh, who can say, well, wait a minute now, tell us, government, what you mean by a belligerent act. And government says, well, a belligerent act constitutes the following. And then you, as a, as a, as a defendant, have an opportunity to say, well, my action didn't fit underneath that. So either they redefine language to mean something it's not. And when I say that, I'm talking about our dear friend, uh, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, who says, well, we don't want to call it welfare anymore. We want to call it transitional living fund. <laughs> Gee whiz, I'm telling you. Every time I hear that phrase, I want to laugh. But it also goes into the idea of the new National Defense Authorization Act, where they say that Section 427 calls for a, a Section uh, 1071, subsection 427, calls for a Conflict Records Research Center. And until, I mean, that sounds like, well, I don't know, it sounds like a library maybe. It's probably not a bad idea. But if you begin to go in here and look at this and understand what it really means, it's essentially authorizing the NSA and the FBI to continue to do what they're doing. And I think that that was passed in this recent NDAA, which just was passed a month ago, for a purpose. The NSA and the FBI are concerned that at some point in time, the courts are going to rule that what they're doing is unconstitutional and stop them. Or there's going to be enough pressure applied on the traitors in Congress to that they either recognize that they're going to have to stop it or we're going to either vote them out of office or drag them out and tar and feather them. So they put in a backstop measure, an end game, a little end run around the backside, a flanking measure that says, well, if we create this records, conflict records research center, we can keep all this data we've been gathering under that and they'll never figure it out or at least it'll take them a couple of years. And before then, well, heck, we'll just be an open tyranny at that point. The mask will come off, the face of evil will show, and we'll kill all the people that are just bothering us. You don't think that kind of conversation actually happens, do you? You don't think people actually think that way, do you? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> if you don't think that at some point there was a meeting where you know, 10 or 12 or 15 of the highest level Nazis sat around and said, what are we going to do about these Jews? I mean, how do we just get rid of them all? What do we got to do to kill them all? And one guy piped up and said, well, you know, bullets are expensive and they're in short supply because we're fighting a war on all these different fronts. So why don't we just use gas? 
we can get a whole bunch at once. And, you know, with the, a little pellet of gas the size of uh, a hockey puck, man, we could knock out a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand. If you don't think that the people who are really in control here talk about the, <clears throat> the collateral damage, <laughs> there's another redefined word, of American citizens, you're very naive. That's why they call it collateral damage, ladies and gentlemen. What it really should be called is murder. Murder perpetrated by a government, whether on its own people or somebody else. But murder is murder. Collateral means innocent. And if you kill an innocent person, they're not collateral damage. They've been murdered. Define the definition, please, of collateral damage. Define the definition, please, of personally identifiable information, right out of the NDAA's own words. Please define the following. Let me get to their definitions page so I can actually give it to you. A gift or a, uh, I'm, I apologize. Um, a gift, uh, the term, a captured record, excuse me, not a gift. Captured record is what, under this plan for uh, complete and utter domination of all of the, the country, in the Conflict Records Research Center, they can hold the term ca captured record, and they define it as such. The term captured record means, quote, listen to this, and tell me this is not exactly what the NSA is already collecting. Document, audio file, video file, or any other material captured during, listen to this, Combat operations. Well, how can we have combat operations? Well, if you look back at the definition, since the United States is now part of the battleground on the war on terror, we are in the combat operation zone. And it says, captured during combat operations from countries, that would include the United States of America, right? They don't exclude the United States of America. Organizations, such as Al-Qaeda, or maybe the Tea Party. Hmm. What do you think? Doesn't exclude American organizations. Or individuals. And here comes the real rub. Now or once hostile to the United States. Hmm. So let's define, what is now or once hostile? Well, in a courtroom scenario, a judge would say, in order to determine what now or once hostile means, we have to go back and look at the original NDAA, which determined, well, now or once hostile is a belligerent act. The belligerent act is the hostility, right? So how do we define a belligerent act? Is a belligerent act what I'm doing right now? Is this a belligerent act? Because I'm exposing the, the monster for what it is? Because I'm talking about the fact that the king doesn't wear any clothes? Well, that can't happen here. Come on, man, you're crazy. Well, it does happen here, and it has happened here, and it's been going on for hundreds of years. What are you talking about? This is America, the land of the free. That doesn't happen here. Well, I beg to differ, but John Adams, who happened to be the president at the time, passed something called the Sedition Act back in 1798. Now, for the record, that was only six years after the original Constitution was completely ratified, including the Bill of Rights. And what the Sedition Act said is, if you make derogatory comments about the president or anybody in Congress, you can be imprisoned for that which is essentially a violation of free speech by anybody's estimation. So don't tell me it can't happen here. In fact, 
That's why Thomas Jefferson and Madison wrote the principles of nullification to say when government acts tyrannically and falls to despotism, which is clearly that when you're violating the First Amendment, right? And you're jailing people for just saying the president's a schmuck. Then, and only then, <clears throat> or, or not only then, then the rightful remedy is for the states to say, we're going to nullify that. And we are not only going to not enforce it, but if you try to enforce it within our state boundaries, we're going to arrest you. That nullification crap is garbage, man. That has no bearing on nothing. You know, that was all settled with the Civil War. Oh, was it? Okay, so then let me ask you something. Colorado and Washington State just passed the legalization of marijuana for recreational use. Isn't that a state nullifying federal law? Well, that's different. No, it's not different. It's not different. When a state says, we're not going to follow and enforce federal law, and by the way, federal law, you're barred from coming in here and trying to enforce it differently also, or, or trying to enforce it in any way, shape, or form, ladies and gentlemen, that's nullification. You can call it something else and redefine it, but it doesn't make it so. New York State, California, I mean California, Connecticut. These are states where they've just passed massive gun legislation that actually makes people register their guns and or turn them in. Ladies and gentlemen, that is nullification, whether you like to admit it or not. The federal law says no one can be infringed from their gun rights. But New York State says, we can infringe all we want. Well, that would be nullification. It's reverse nullification, but it is nullification nonetheless. See, how language is used makes all the difference in the world. You know, Obozo in 2010 made a statement. And with this, I'm going to wrap this segment up. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are those with something to hide. Mr. President, thou dost protesteth too much. Ever notice how Somebody who is the first to come out and scream about something is often very, very guilty of that themselves. Yeah. Okay. I'd like you to get over to see our friends over at Cigar and Patriot, uh, the Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop over in West Plains on the Court Square. Please give them a shout at 417-257-1776 for tobacco products of all kinds and shapes, chewable, smokable, Pipes, paper, whatever you got. It's a great place, by the way. I go over there once in a while, just sit down and have a chat with the guys. You can get, get your hair cut over there at Wits End Classic Barbershop while you're at it, which wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Um, Jason Henry on the, on the square is a great attorney at 417-256-4100. That's 417-256-4100. Uh, handles cases for criminal law on both state and federal levels. Uh, you can get to our friends over at Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard in West Plains for a great lunch special. And on Tuesday night, kids eat free, family night. And then make sure that you see our friends over at the Battery Station at BatteryStation.com. You can also reach them at 417-257-7799. If you're interested in building a website for your business, go to AirBridgeWeb.com. That's AirBridgeWeb, like air you breathe and a bridge you drive over, Web.com. We'll be right back. It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. 
We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. All right. Good morning, America. If you're a late riser, snick, snick, snick on you. You're only catching the second half of America's Voice now. (laughs) But never fear, I've got a solution to that problem. (laughs) How did you know that was coming? Well, if you ever miss one of our fact and fun-filled sessions, you can always go over and you can listen to it on our brand new listen line that allows you to dial in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can catch America's Voice Live in the morning, between 8 and 10. And then after that, the show just repeats all day long. So you can dial into our phone line, and it's it's free to you. I mean, it's a long-distance call, perhaps, for you. But, I mean, it's there's no charges of any kind, and it doesn't cost you anything. If you're dialing on a mobile phone or your your national security agency personal tracking device, you know, the one that they advocate every American should have, um, then and you're using your unlimited minutes, then it really doesn't cost you anything at all, right? If you're calling from a home phone, as long as you have unlimited long distance, you can call 415-325-0725. That's 415-325-0725. Now, that number was provided for us, and this entire service is provided for us by a group called Audio Now, who I am extraordinarily grateful to. Why? Because they've given me another outlet to offer to our listenership so that If they're out there and they're driving in their car and you've got a long trip ahead of you or even a short trip and you just want to, you know, catch a segment or a piece of it, uh, by all means, you can do that. Those people who have low bandwidth Internet and can't stream our show live, by all means, uh, then they can certainly call into the listen line because, well, it's a telephone line. Uh, If you're outside of our broadcast area, a terrestrial radio broadcast area, and you can't get access to a computer or you don't want to use data on your phone, then by all means, you can call into our listen line at 415-325-0725. That's 415-325-0725. Free service provided by Audio Now. And it was free to us, by the way, which is really cool because, you know, we operate on a shoestring. Actually, we operate on a shoe thread. <laughs> Let me be clear. I don't want you to redefine that at all. <laughs> In concert with our last section, I want this to be a true definition. And um, we don't operate on a shoe string. We operate on a shoe thread. Yeah, not, no, it's not even an intertwined or multi-threaded thread. It's just a single thread. <laughs> If you can help us, by the way, fatten that thread, by all means, please feel free to do so at any time. And I didn't mean this to be a monetary pitch, but hey, every penny counts. You can jump onto our website where you can actually sponsor us um, through our uh, monthly plan. And you can pick the amount. You don't have to pick one of those predefined amounts. But uh, there are amounts in there that, you know, silver, gold, and platinum, which is kind of campy, but whatever. We used it. And, uh, or you can make a one-time donation. If you'd like to mail us a donation, you can do so. You can mail it to us at P.O. Box 1195, West Plains, Missouri, 65775. That's America's Voice Now, P.O. Box 1195, West Plains, Missouri, 65775. And i got to tell you, um, we are always in need of money because, and, and, you know, everything costs stuff. And uh, I do most of it out of my pocket, and, you know, I'm fast running out of options for that and if you want to help uh me to be able to continue to afford to pay for all of this um i'd be more than happy to have you do that uh i develop websites for a living and other services you can go to our website at air uh, airbridgeweb.com that's airbridge web air like you breathe bridge like you drive over web i own a company called airbridge and it's for telecommunications consulting and web development and so forth and so on airbridgeweb.com you call that number, 
uh, or go to that website, you'll see some examples of some of the sites that we've developed. Uh, we do sites that are both large and small. We've done many, many national sites. We do search engine optimization uh, for individuals and companies that uh, are trying to make sure that they're at the top of the search engines for Google and Yahoo and, and Bing and so forth and so on. Um, I need the work, and you probably need a good website, so give me a call. I'll be happy to help you with it. You can also email me if you just want to uh, communicate quickly on it, and you can email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. We also do e-learning programs, which can be incorporated to uh, be anything from a, a, uh, a lesson plan to a full-blown training seminar that can be done completely uh, on, the, on a computer system or on the web. And, you know, based on their answers, it takes them one direction or another. And the, the capabilities are limitless on that. And we do that for a lot of very large corporate clients and some small ones. Okay, that's enough pitch about me. This segment is called a half a trillion dollars to be compliant with tyranny. And the reason I'm throwing that out there is because, you know, we keep hearing about regulation, regulation, the regulation nation and all of that nonsense. Well, the, IR, the EPA just came out with a brand new regulation on wood stoves. Can you imagine? I mean, come on. You know, all the collected wood stoves in the world don't generate as much smoke as one wildfire or anywhere near the amount of smoke of one volcanic explosion. In fact, one volcanic eruption, ladies and gentlemen, generates more pollution into the atmosphere than all the vehicles on Earth for a year. So you can throw that one at your global warming friends, but of course they'll never believe you. They'll just jump down to the emotional argument because they don't want to hear facts and figures. They just want to you know, continue to wallow in their bias. <laughs> Hey, that's a cool phrase. Wallow in your bias. I like that. Sometimes I even surprise myself. <laughs> so there's an article out there in the Patriot Update. And Patriot Update is one of the alternative news sites that I use. Obama regs have cost $500 billion during, uh, during the first five years in office. Now, the American Action Forum... It's a center-right policy research institute, which already tells you that they're a biased group, right? Everybody's got a bias, even you, even me. Uh, but basically, they did a study to determine what was it costing businesses to meet all these regulatory burdens. Now, this didn't inc incorporate Obamacare, of course, because that's a whole other animal, and nobody even has any grasp on what that's going to be yet. But it's basically... The regulatory costs are over $112 billion a year. And a half a trillion dollars, which is what the $500 billion is, is actually, you know, our entire gross domestic product is only $16 trillion a year. $16 trillion. Which ought to scare the poop out of you when you realize that we have a budget deficit of a trillion. <laughs> wow. And we have a debt that already exceeds our GDP. Now, any economist that looks at debt and, and gross domestic product, which is the country's ability to pay back the debt, looks at 100% debt and GDP ratio as the, that's when the, you start hearing, whoop, 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 clang, 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 alarm bell, alarm bell, whoop, whoop, whoop. Why? Because when your debt, equals your gross domestic product, you're upside down. And our debt now exceeds our gross domestic product. And any economist, other than maybe that knucklehead over at the New York Times, what's his name? Uh, I can't even think of it now. I want to say Friedman, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, look, anybody who is not got a bias towards, you know, trying to manipulate and fool the public, would recognize right up front that when you've got a, a debt of $17 trillion and an income, national income, of $16 trillion, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. From 2009 to 2013... Regulators have published 495 
billion dollars in final rules. This is the cost to to just to just to be in compliance. And when you look at a lot of what these rules are, they are really completely unnecessary rules. I mean, I, I get the fact that, you know, there are certain rules that make sense, right? So, you know, you, you want to make sure that we've got clean, uh, the clean water and that, you know, some company that manufactures, let's say, ceiling paint isn't, you know, dumping some kind of toxic uh, peroxide or something into the water, right? I get it. And I'm gonna, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't want to breathe dirty air, and I don't want to drink dirty water. And I don't want us to have to buy a, you know, a national Berkey <laughs> to be able to, you know, survive and drink some water, right? But on the flip side of the fence, I also don't want our nation so far upside down in, in the concept that we are, we are so wrapped up in trying to just pass regulation for regulation's sake so that we can... Um, justify our existence in, in extra constitutional administrative agencies, because that's what they are, that we lose sight of the fact that government's real job is to protect individuals and to protect the environment under which businesses can flourish. So if you're, if, you know, if you're sitting there and you're pouring poison on your own tomato plant and you wonder why it's not growing, duh, That's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. We've now become the snake who eats its own tail. The ticks have now become so voluminous on the dog that the ticks outweigh the dog. And they're bleeding it to death. I mean, you know, you got little Fido there. He weighs eight pounds. And he's got eight and a half pounds worth of ticks hanging on them. And they're all fat and sassy on his blood. Here's a mental picture for you. (laughs) The point is, well, the point is real clear when when you hear what the idea of Alexander Hamilton was. And he was very, very abundantly clear about it. It will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice. If those laws are so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. If they're repealed or revised even before they're instituted or if they undergo such incessant change that no one today who knows what the law is can figure out what it will be tomorrow. The instrument by which government must act is either authority of the law or force. And if authority is destroyed, then force must be substituted. And when this becomes the ordinary instrument of government, there is an end to liberty. But don't boom I rest my case. I I mean, I could almost end the segment right now, except we have nine minutes to go. (laughs) Right? I mean, look at it that way. It's not going to make us feel any better if the people who are passing all of these tyrannical laws are people that we put in power by electorate, if we chose them, right? And it doesn't really make us feel any better, nor does it help us function if the laws are so voluminous, if they're so thick and so stacked so high that we, they, there's no person that can possibly read them all. Well, I refer you to the Federal Register where they are pumped out and promulgated like as if it's a toilet paper manufactory over there. And it's not going to do us any good if they're so incoherent that we can't possibly understand them. How do we know that? Well, because it cost us a half a trillion dollars, a hundred billion bucks a year, just to be in compliance with them. 
You know what the number one new job is in America? You won't believe this, but it's true. Compliance officers. Corporations around the country are hiring, even when they're firing people off the line and their sales force and their distribution force and their warehouse people and they're cutting people back to try to fall up underneath the Obamacare mandate and get below 50 or whatever their deal is. The one job every business is hiring, a compliance officer. Even the term sounds communistic, <laughs> right? I am the party member. I am here to make sure you do everything by party rules. That was almost, I don't know, kind of like a Chinese Hawaiian thing instead of a Russian. <laughs> Sometimes my accents get con confuzzled. <laughs> but the point is that when you are hiring people to remain in compliance with a government that's obviously ap operating in tyranny, the laws have become so incoherent that they can't be understood because we've got to hire somebody who that's all they do. That's their sole function. They're not bringing revenue into the company. They're not producing anything. They're not manufacturing anything. They're not shipping anything. They're not a constructive, functional member of the organization who delivers something to our bottom line. They're there just to make sure we don't run afoul of some crazy cockamamie law that could get us shut down or fined and further cost our bottom line. So we would rather trim our bottom line by hiring another person who we've got to pay 70, 80, 150, $220,000 a year than take the risk that we might get fined 6 million bucks because we forgot to paint this thing yellow. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what it's about, people. And if you're one of the little sisters of the poor who's currently filing in federal court against the Obamacare mandate, it would cost them $6 million. I think it was a, I can't remember whether it was a day or a year or whatever. My point is, I mean, you got to be kidding me. You're going to sit there and take a bunch of nuns, nuns. Eric Holder looks like a real hero here, doesn't he? Y you know what, Eric, th this whole thing with the nuns reminds me of with Eric Holder? The knockout game, like some young punk walks up and knocks out an 87-year-old lady and then says to his friends, ha, <laughs> look at that, did you see that, man? That's Eric Holder. He's the punk. I would love, I would love to be locked in a room with Eric Holder for about 20 minutes with nobody worrying about the consequence. <laughs> oh, boy, would I. Harry Reid, too, and Harry Reid's a boxer, for the record. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to have, I'd, I'd like Harry and I to get into the ring. Just five minutes. But the point is this. If the, if, if the laws that are instituted or, or thrown upon us and forced upon us, we've, we've already reached the point where they're so voluminous that we can't read them all. They're so oh, incoherent, we have to actually hire somebody to try to figure them out. By the way, I didn't even talk about the IRS and taxes because, I mean, you've got to have an accountant to file your taxes. Even on an, as an individual, forget as a business where you might have, you know, all different kinds of levels of income and product costs and all the rest of that. But to go on, he says, if, if they undergo such incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow... What's the first word that comes to your mind when you hear that phrase? Obamacare. The law has been passed, and it's undergone such incessant change that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. First of all, we had never even really truly figured out what it is, because according to Nancy, we had to pass it to see what was going to be in it. Well, we made that foolish move, or I should say the Democrats made that foolish move on our behalf, and then the president turns around and starts making unilateral dictatorial changes to it that nobody even has any oversight on. And nobody's held them accountable, not the courts, not Congress, nobody. Nobody. And so the law has undergone such incessant changes that no man who thought he might know what the law meant today <laughs> can guess what it will mean tomorrow. Which is, by the way, why we have... Literally, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of corporations firing people and putting people on from full-time to part-time to get beneath a lower level of 50 employees. What a crime. What a crime against our nation. The instrument by which government must act. There's really only two. Authority of the law or force. If the authority of the law is destroyed, then force must be substituted. And where force becomes the ordinary instrument that government utilizes to operate, there is an end to liberty. Okay, force used as the only primary. Okay, let's see, NSA, FBI, IRS, uh, EPA, Department of Justice. That's enough right there. I don't even have to keep going. Half a trillion to be compliant with tyranny. And it's not enough. The bully says, I want more lunch money. Tomorrow you're going to be, bring me back your lunch money and your sister's. <laughs> That's when you haul up and go, pow, right in the nose. And when you bloody his nose, by the way, usually he stops asking for the lunch money. <laughs> At least that's been my experience. Not that I was the bully, I, but I've been bullied for a little bit. Okay, we've got two minutes left. I'm going to run through our friends who are sponsoring us. Make sure that you visit these guys and that you, um, that you patronize their establishments and their businesses because they're the ones who keep America's voice on the air. Um, you know, they help to pay for the airtime on the radio stations that we broadcast. Now, we have to buy that airtime, so uh, please help us to help you. The Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop at uh, number 2 Court Square in West Plains, 417-257-1776. I love that phone number. I wish I had that phone number. Um, Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop. Our friends over at Wits End Classic Barbershop. Jason is my buddy over there, and he will give you a great haircut. I was going to go there yesterday, and, well, never got there. Normal. That's the story of my life, by the way. <laughs> Putting out fires all over the place. Um, Jason will cut your hair for 10 bucks. Does a great job. I promise I will get in there sometime today, hopefully. And... Um, He's a, he's a great young man, and it's a great place to go. Our friends over at uh, uh, the law offices of Jason Henry, also on the square in West Plains, 417-256-4100. He does criminal and civil cases, of course, but he also does criminal on the federal side, and that's an important aspect. And he's so close to the courthouse, he could literally fly your brief across the street with a, in a paper airplane. But make sure you see our friends over at Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard in West Plains. Pizza Hut, uh, they have a lunch special over there, and I go in there and have the salad bar all the time. Uh, great salad bar. It's really awesome. And they're the only Pizza Hut in the world that would sponsor a crazy guy like me, huh? <laughs> uh, also, our friends over at Battery Station. Batterystation.com, 417-257-7799. 417-257-7799. You can find their website by going to batterystation.com. You can email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. I want to hear from you. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. those of you that are not radio initiated dude this is bumper music you know plays in in the beginning and the end and some kid in Romania wrote this for me <laughs> I really like it it's actually like a five minute song and I go I only get to play you you know this short brief brief piece of it and you know I'm usually talking over it but you know it kicks on at a specific time to remind me to shut up <laughs> Because the commercials are coming. The commercials are coming. 
Yeah, I know I'm in a weird mood today. I'm getting emails like, what are you talking about? What's up with you? No, I have not, I have not had anything to drink except coffee. Got to have that coffee because this is too early in the morning for me without coffee. You know, it's funny, people around here, I live in the Midwest in Missouri, people around here say to me, I can always tell that you're from New Jersey when you say the word coffee, because you say coffee, <laughs> not coffee. <laughs> Gotta have my coffee, hey. All right, um, this segment was designed to be a general topic, and it doesn't have any story specifically tied to it, but I want to start out by reading you a statement that was, I thought, indicative of the overall situation. You know, John Adams, and he's a guy I got a bit of a problem with because if you recall our earlier discussion in the previ- one of the previous segments, he's the guy who passed the Sedition Act. And he was one of our, you know, founders originally, but I think he, you know, he got... Sidetracked. Corrupted by his power. And he filed the Sedition Act. But in this case, we're going to pass that because he he made this quote in 1798. And uh, I'm sorry, it was earlier than that. Uh, Well, I'd have to pull it up and I'm, I'm mistaken. So. Anyway, here's the quote, and it doesn't matter when he made it. What matters is what he said. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Now, there's lots of you out there who... I've, I've had people say to me, why don't you bring religion up more in your programs? And I've had other people say, you mention religion too much. And I, I got to tell you that the truth is right down the middle. I mention it, but I don't like the idea of... Th- there's already enough fracture out there. And I'm a spiritual guy. But I don't think it's my place to, you know, support one, one you know, denomination over another. And there's enough of that fracture going on right now. And we really don't need to add to it. But I got to tell you that the concept of, and I'm not saying that as somebody who's an atheist cannot be moral, but I am saying that religion gives moral men boundaries. And it helps them to remain moral. Why do I say that? Well, many of the things that we as a society look at and say, these are our, these are the precepts upon which, you know, we want our society to operate. These are the boundaries. These are the lines we've drawn that you say, you know, don't cross over that line because when you cross over that line, you've, you've gone too far. You've, taking things in another direction, in a bad direction, right? We all agree that, you know, the principles, and, and, and our, our nation was founded on the principles of the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, you're not supposed to lie, you're not supposed to cheat, steal, you know, covet your neighbor's goods and or his wife <laughs> or husband. You know, all of the, all the normal religious restrictions that, and I shouldn't say restrictions, but the guidelines that were given to us. And I find it, interesting that people who say well religion is you know religion has no part in government well i i would beg to differ because you see religion gives you guidelines the the moral guidelines if you will just like the constitution gives us the instruction guidelines for the country And you don't have to necessarily be, you know, a, a, a Catholic or a Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Shinto. I don't really care. I know that most religions, and I say most because, 
you know, even Satanism is a religion, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, there's that thing of right now where the Satanists are trying to get a statue built in the in the uh, state house in Oklahoma because the state of Oklahoma said, we don't care what federal law does. We're nullifying that. We're going to put up a plaque on the, tenth, the Ten Commandments in the, in the state house. And so under some idiotic court ruling by some jerk in the Supreme Court or a group of jerks in the Supreme Court, the Satanists said, ah, so under that ruling, that means you've got to give us equal time or equal space or equal equality, shall we say. And so they've concocted and determined that they've built this statue that's like, I don't know, eight feet tall. And it's a goat-headed demon with wings and horns. And it's sitting there on a, on a throne, and it's got its arms around two children. And that they want to put up as their answer to the Ten Commandments in the Oklahoma State House. So those of you who would think that Satanism is not a religion would be mistaken. In fact, even atheism, I mean, if you really want to get down to it, is a religion. Right? So, our Constitution was made for a moral and a religious people. And the real problem that we have here, the real problem that we as a nation are experiencing right now, is not one necessarily of oppression by our government, and it's not one of... I, I, I guess the, the simplest way to sum this up is that the real problem that we're experiencing is that we are allowing immoral behavior to happen because we have lost our balance and our center. And we are not a moral and religious people. We're not. And so if morality in our country is dead, then so is the republic. Because even if we, I guess, I guess if you look at it from this perspective, if we save the republic, let's assume for argument's sake that, you know, Unicorns exist, and <laughs> tomorrow morning, everybody in Congress says, to use, to use uh, Sweeney's uh, 535, that's the 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, the President, and nine Supreme Court justices. And all of them raise their hand and say, we agree we've been operating in tyranny, and we therefore resign. Have a nice day. And they all leave and go home. Now what? Well, the truth of the matter is we're going to be right, right back where we are today in relatively short order anyway. If we do not look at the problem that we have with morality in this country. It is so critical because morality... Let me take this out of a religious context for a moment. Morality is, in a way, integrity. Integrity to yourself and your beliefs, and also to those foundational principles that we all know to be true. You know, you, you don't hurt someone else. You don't steal. You don't, you don't injure someone. You don't take from someone what doesn't belong to you. And integrity is who you are when nobody's looking. Integrity is the kind of thing that we've forgotten in this country. We've got literally uh, 535 people who are running our government who essentially don't have any integrity. And that doesn't count the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of minions beneath them. I mean, 20 million, right? 20 million people work for the government, state and federal. 
It's one fifth of our entire population of workers. And their integrity and morality should say to them, if what I'm doing is oppressive, then I should stop. And they're willing to sacrifice our country for their benefit personally by retaining their job, quite frankly. So even when we say, okay, look, 535 have vacated the spot. We're going to appoint new people just temporarily so we can run elections again. The problem is that our society, and I dare say it's not just ours, but I'm only concerned with ours. Our society has become this, this issue of or, or, or is infected and in, in, <laughs> infested with this idea that if there's nothing in it for me, then, you know, I don't want to do it. Or the first question out of their mouth is, what's in it for me? You know, you remember the old phrase that you hear from time to time from JFK? We don't ever hear that kind of message today. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I'm not one of these people that says, you know, we should all follow this altruistic mantra that says, you know, we, we should all sacrifice for the greater good. That's a communistic philosophy, and I don't believe in it at all. I do believe that I should do what's best for me. But within reason, and only to the extent that I don't injure someone else or utilize or attempt to try to do something that would cause someone else to be injured. Economically, physically, and emotionally, any other way. So, when we have a situation today where immorality seems to be, it's almost like these people who are out there in the public sphere want to, it's almost like they want to challenge the boundaries of it every day. They, like, like, if there's any stone of morality left unturned, I'm going to flip it. And I don't want to be a prude, and I don't want to suggest that, you know, people can't do what they want to do. That's not my place to dictate what somebody can and can't do. I mean, I don't want to tell you who to, you know, what to do or who to do it with, what you can ingest into your body. I don't believe in that. Not my place to tell you. If you want to smoke pot, I don't advise it, but I'm not going to tell you you can't. Just because I don't believe in it. I don't think you should. But I, I'm, I'm not in a position where, you know, I'm making some rules and everybody's going to have to follow them. That would make me a dictator, which, is, which I, I abhor. And I won't become that which I abhor. You know why? Because the corruption that comes with that, that, like, stump, starts to fly out of the ether and stick to you like a magnet. <laughs> no man has a shield from that. No man, no woman. Y'all know me well enough that I don't have to do that PC crap. When I say man, I mean everybody. If you're insulted by that, you're listening to the wrong dude. <laughs> no one is an island. And that doesn't mean... You, you know, we've all heard that phrase relating to people and saying, well, you know, this is uh, no man's an island. They can't live uh, alone emotionally. They have to have a human interaction. No man is an island in the world of corruption either. You can't live on an island in a sea of poison and not have it affect you. You can't swim in an ocean of poison and not have it absorbed via osmosis through your skin. 
You can't live in a society that is a sea of poison and, and walk and live amongst it and not have it influence you and corrupt you. Corrupt you in ways which don't necessarily have to even be religious, but just are corrupting in, their, in the way in which you think and view the world and yourself. And yet again, no man can be an island. So we can't, you know, just all say, well, that's it, I'm packing it up, I'm going to go live in a cabin in the woods. Because that doesn't work either. You know, there have been times in humanity where the pendulum swings one way and then it completely swings the other, right? Right? Pendulum starts out here and swings across and then eventually swings back. I mean, we can point to periods in history where the, it, it's, it's occurred that way. And I'm talking about, you know, the, the societal norms or, or accepted societal norms of morality. Right? And we can see excess faux morality in play right now. And, you, and you, can, you know for a fact that that's just as bad as no morality. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that in Islam, your wife has to keep herself fully clothed to the point where she's got to cover herself up in a burk in 125 degree heat and the dagnab thing is black. <laughs> Who thunk up that idea? But simultaneously... One of the worst problems for pornography, both hetero and homosexual, is in the Middle East. <laughs> that for some reason or another, there's a dichotomy over there that having sex with a little boy is okay, but having sex with an adult man is not. Hello. So my point, and that's, that's faux morality. That's morality for a false purpose because everybody acknowledges we're not following it anyway. We've fallen victim to the same thing here, but in a different way. Thou shalt not lie. Everybody acknowledges that. that. I mean, I don't think that, that, I think that precept pretty much runs across all religions, right? Thou shalt not lie. But look at these people in Congress who are the 535. Look at the 535. Are they living by that? Thou shalt not steal. Religious or irreligious, Yellow, red, black, and white, I don't care where you come from, stealing's not appropriate and it's not accepted in any society. Eh, period. End of argument. But look at the 535. Not only are they stealing from us and knowing that they're abusing it, and knowing that we know that they're abusing what they've stolen from us, but they know for a fact that they are stealing not only from us, but from future generations who haven't even been born yet. It's not a mistake. It's willful. And the degree of a crime is in direct proportion to your guilty knowledge and your intent. Can't be guilty of a crime if you didn't intend a crime. Can't be guilty of a crime if you didn't know it was a crime. But when you, will, when you know it's a crime and you willfully intend to continue to do something that you know to be wrong, whether legally wrong or morally wrong, makes no difference. The 535 are not moral. The people who are 
trying to influence our, our, our society and our governments and our situations across the board are not moral. I can tell you that they're not moral just because I look at the tactics that they use. And that tells me that whatever their agenda is, you cannot... It's, it's, the, it's the argument of the ends justify the means. You cannot be a moral person if you use immoral tactics to achieve your ends. Evil cannot beget good. And that, that listen, that crosses, I mean, in endless boundaries. The problem that we have is even if we retake our country today, how many times have I said the phrase, take America back, take back America, restore the Constitution to its rightful place? If we are not going to if we are not going to use the power and the authority that is delegated to government in a moral fashion, and that's only because individuals become the, the instruments of that, then for all intents and purposes, it really doesn't make any difference whether John Boehner is the Speaker of the House, or Harry Reid is the majority leader, or President Barack Obama is leader. An immoral people will do immoral things, and the Constitution won't be followed by anyone. I don't have some, you know, crystal ball that, or global answer to the problem. I believe that religion gives men moral boundaries, as I said before. It, it's the fence, it's the corral that keeps the wild horses in line. For some people, I think it's a, a reminder, a daily reminder, or a weekly reminder that, you know, these are the boundaries we live by. For other people, it's fear. I don't want to go to hell. For other people, it's respect. These are the precepts that God gave us, and we have an obligation to live under them and do the right thing because he's given us the freedom and the liberty, but it comes with the price of moral conduct in our actions. You know, <laughs> I fear greatly for our nation. But I have to tell you, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that even if we can light the fires of restoration, that we may not have the right people to do the job. You've been listening to America's Voice. Make sure that you see our friends and uh, patronize our sponsors. Patriot uh, Cigar and Tobacco Shop, 417-257-1776. Uh, Wits End Classic Barber Shop at number two, Court Square in West Plains. I'm going to go see Jason today. Jason, if you're listening, I'm coming. <laughs> the law offices of Jason Henry, another Jason, 417-256-4100. He's also on the square in West Plains. The Pizza Hut uh, on Porter Wagoner Boulevard. Bruce, I'm coming to have lunch. And um, Battery Station at BatteryStation.com, 417-257-7799. Thanks for riding with us today. Thoughts to ponder. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. God bless.